Well, welcome all. Um, <clears throat> those of you who I've not had a chance to meet yet, my name is David Gator. I'm the uh, new chair of physical medicine and rehabilitation and um, fortunate to be involved with the uh, model systems program um, and actually was recently um, provided an opportunity to be a research scientist with the Miami Project uh, to cure paralysis. Um, I'm uh, excited to uh, speak to you today. I'm going to give you uh, kind of an overview of uh, where my career has taken me. Um, there uh, is an awful lot that I won't cover, um, but I do want to spend some time talking through the, um, the issues of neurogenic obesity and metabolic dysfunction after spinal cord injury. And hopefully this will move forward. There we go. So um, I'll start off uh, describing a little bit about spinal cord injury, the comorbidities. Many of you are well aware of those. And then I'm going to start uh, drawing in links with obesity that maybe you're not uh, aware of, including some discussion about how obesity basically drives the metabolic syndrome. And, and I'll define that a little bit more as we go through. I want to talk about the um, unique physiology of spinal cord injury that uh, really puts this population at incredible risk, but it also provides us an amazing model to study obesity and metabolic syndrome uh, because of that. And then we'll talk through a little bit about some research uh, opportunities as we move forward. So most of you recognize that um, managing folks with spinal cord injury requires a village. Um, and there are multiple specialty staff of lots of different disciplines. In fact, it's, it's no um, mistake that SCI is smack dab in the middle of the words interdisciplinary. Um, so um, those of us who are managing folks with spinal cord injury, our mission in, in includes helping them through the acute stage of their injury, um, getting them to the point where they can get out into the community on their own and uh, sustain a lifestyle. Um, as we go through that process, we're going to be continuing to provide education to patients and their family members, um, hopefully get them uh, tied into psych, so, uh, social and vocational rehabilitation, and then um, ideally uh, have them involved with research and education as we go through this. So the central nervous system, as you all know, is comprised of brain and cord. The somatic nervous system uh, represents the motor, that is the movement aspects of, um, of the nervous system as well as the sensory components. Um, you also recognize that the autonomic nervous system is intimately uh, related with the central nervous system and is comprised of uh, both parasympathetic and sympathetic components. The, um, the, the two are constantly in a tug of war um, so that at any given time Neither system is completely turned off uh, at any given time. You have ongoing wrestling between your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. The sympathetic nervous system, um, as you know, as hopefully this will move forward. So I'm, I'm running in. Uh, so sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight. Um, as we go through there, um, the Sympathetic nervous system arises, however, from the thoracolumbar regions of the cord. And I think oftentimes we forget that's where the sympathetic nervous system begins. That's its origin. Um, it is opposed by the parasympathetic nervous system. And the parasympathetic nervous system provides rest and digest opportunities. So sympathetic nervous system throughout our lifetimes helps us deal with uh, crisis situations. After the crisis is over, the parasympathetic nervous system comes on strong and the sympathetic nervous system kicks back and relaxes a little bit because it knows the parasympathetic nervous system is going to provide substrates, replenish all the fuels that were utilized during that crisis situation. We also know that, uh, and, I'm, and I'm trying, there we go. Um, because of this imbalance after a spinal cord injury, there is sympathetic blunting and parasympathetic dominance. And so generally speaking, we don't hear much from the sympathetic nervous system, at least initially. However, uh, soon uh, after the spinal cord injury, and it may be uh, days or it may be weeks and in some cases months, um, the, the sympathetic nervous system, while we still can't access it voluntarily or, or even automatically, um, has grown 
uh, in proportion. So it, it is capable of having a huge output. Um, and the, the receptors, the adrenergic receptors, have been missing any sympathetic influence for weeks, months, et cetera. Um, and so when we have a noxious stimuli below the level of the injury, that uh, precipitates a sympathetic outflow that is now magnified many times from what it would have been otherwise. And we end up with uh, splanchnic vascular bed constriction, hypertensive crisis, uh, and it puts people at high risk for strokes, seizures, and organ failure as we go through there. Now we talk about T6 as being a very important level and that's because T7 and T8 give off the greater splanchnic nerve which goes to the entire splanchnic vascular bed which is really how most of us are controlling. Did you realize this? You're controlling your blood pressure right now by the tone in your splanchnic vascular bed. But if you're not able to do that um, and in this situation we have sympathetic outflow basically causing constriction, vasoconstriction of the splanchnic vascular bed, that's when we end up with this hypertensive crisis. The other thing that we need to re uh, remember is that T7 and T8 give off the nerves to the adrenal medulla. The adrenal medulla is also dumping all of these uh, adrenergic, the catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine as we go through there. So that if you get a distended bladder, afferents send those, that information up the cord, but it's blocked at the level of the spinal cord injury, and you get this reflex sympathetic outflow causing splanchnic vasoconstriction and hypertension. As the pressure is perceived by aortic bodies, et cetera, information is sent to the medulla, which sends information back to the heart and causes a relative bradycardia. However, below the level of the injury, everything remains vasoconstricted. Whereas above the level of the injury, you have vasodilation, sweating, and a pounding headache we attribute to autonomic dysreflexia. So just as a reminder, and I've, and I've got lots of different folks of different backgrounds, and so I'm going to briefly put together uh, what the cord looks like. Your cord is about the size of your little finger at the level of your neck, um, and uh, it is comprised of lots of afferent information coming from the body to the brain, and efferent information coming from the brain back down to the cord, and everything is bundled tightly, um, basically insulated from other signals so that information is communicated effectively up and down. This is a very simplistic cartoon showing uh, efferent fibers on one side and afferent fibers on the other side of this little cartoon. The reality is that you have both efferent and afferent fibers on both sides of the cord. So, um, subsequently we have information going from the brain down uh, to the rest of the body. Um, in a number of very specific tracks we have information uh, coming up the cord from the body to the brain, also in very specific uh, tracks. And then at about one centimeter intervals we have afferent information coming in, we have efferent information going out. We have inner neurons, some of which are facilitatory some of which are uh, inhibitory. And so the bottom line is, and this is a very simplistic cartoon, I get that, but if you were to damage the cord, you're gonna interrupt those pathways um, as you're coming through. And so you're left with a situation often with a cavity, and that cavity is essentially encircled by 360 degrees of glial scar. Now remember also that 90% of the cord is uh, uh, glial cells. Only about 10% of the cord actually are neurons running through their up and down. So um, if we were to repair the cord, we're going to have to somehow break through this glial scar. Um, and then typically there's a cavity of sorts uh, in there as well. Now we could potentially put cells in that cavity uh, to allow new neurons that are going to develop to cross um, essentially a bridge as you're going through. But it's not that easy. You've also got a number of inhibitory proteins uh, that are hostile to neural cells. So the no-go proteins, the myelin-associated glycoproteins, tumor necrosis factor alpha, nuclear factor kappa B, all of these are inhibitory proteins that are very hostile to newly developing neurons um, as they're trying to grow through there. Those new neurons also require specific uh, growth factors present in very specific concentrations at specific times in uh, the neuron's development. 
But even if we could provide that, and we have scientists here working on uh, Dr. Uh, Pierce has been working closely with Dr. Bungi, et cetera, over a number of years, um, but we've still had struggles uh, with directional guidance. And if you can't direct those neurons to, um, to interact with other neurons appropriately, then you have the potential for mispi misfiring, and that would be uh, what causes our increased spasticity, neuropathic pain, et cetera. So um, all of that to say I'm grateful to be here in Miami working with uh, groups of folks who are really trying to cure uh, paralysis. Um, but until we get there, we also have to figure out what we're going to do with our folks who have a spinal cord injury. And so I want to share a case study with you, a uh, 24-year-old Army Ranger without significant past medical history. Now, to be an Army Ranger, uh, you are essentially the best of the best. This is a, a physical specimen uh, beyond, you know, 0.01 percent of the world. Um, and they're also incredibly intelligent. This uh, young gentleman, unfortunately, uh, took a sniper bullet to the neck, um, and that bullet uh, not just caused a spinal cord injury, uh, but also fracture of the spine, and as I recall, fracture of uh, the mandible as well. Um, this occurred um, over in Afghanistan. He was uh, life flighted to Germany, initially um, was stabilized there, brought to the United States, and subsequently came to our unit when I was at the Richmond VA. Um, he was still on a mechanical ventilator with C4 complete spinal cord injury. Um, he had a tracheostomy, he had a peg, and unfortunately he had a grade three pressure injury, and this is how he came to us. Um, so he went from this uh, amazing specimen of uh, manhood to having all of these comorbidities uh, within a matter of moments in some cases and other things that we're going to develop over time. So um, at the bottom of the list, it didn't happen immediately, but actually pretty quickly um, is obesity and subsequently the metabolic uh, syndrome. So why is obesity such a big deal? There are multiple things associated with it, comorbidities associated with it, and I really want to talk you through the process a little bit, but can you be healthy and obese? Um, there's a lot of literature both sides of, of that uh, question. Um, before the turn of the century, folks were all already saying if you have increased adipose tissue, that's going to allow for a phenotypic expression um, of uh, what we're going to call the metabolic syndrome, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. We also know, Kramer uh, reported out just a few years ago, that uh, Individuals who are obese are, in fact, at uh, significantly high risk for adverse um, long-term outcomes. And so, um, as an example, uh, Italy. Italy sent us a statue of Michelangelo's David. Uh, um, it went to Las Vegas, the city of plenty. Um, and it was only there a few years, and, uh, and, and it went through some major changes. And so you might say that now he's about to phenotypically express what wouldn't have been expressed otherwise. We were asked to put together a volume, um, and actually Dr. Nash and I contributed uh, to this um, more than a decade ago about obesity and spinal cord injury. Uh, we reported at that time that it was an epidemic. Folks uh, still didn't quite hear us, um, but we were saying because um, individuals with spinal cord injury have an obligatory sarcopenia, they've lost a lot of muscle mass, they have a blunted anabolism, they can't build new muscle or bone very, very easily, they have a blunted sympathetic nervous system because of the spinal cord injury and a positive energy balance, and as I will describe, that actually leads to obesity. Positive energy is a negative thing. Um, in that scenario. We also know that obesity mediates the metabolic syndrome, that is, it causes insulin resistance, hypertension, dyslipidemia, thromboembolism, and coronary artery disease. Now, back in the day, way before the turn of the century, and I took my first obesity class in the 80s, um, we knew there was an association with these things, but we didn't realize that obesity was actually driving uh, these components of the metabolic syndrome. 
So um, there are several different uh, definitions. The National Cholesterol Education Project, Adult uh, Treatment Panel 3 has their definitions. It's too small for you to read on purpose. Um, the World Health Organization has a separate uh, but different uh, definition. Um, all these folks got together in 2005 to come up with the International Diabetes Federation definition of the metabolic syndrome which included central obesity plus any two of the following. So elevated uh, triglycerides, low HDL cholesterol, elevated blood pressure, and um, elevated blood sugars. Um, and so uh, we recently, uh, actually just this year, uh, published um, on 473 veterans at the Richmond VA, mean age of 56, 50% 50 uh, had tetraplegia and about 50% had paraplegia. Three quarters of them had a BMI of greater than 22. Now, those of you who know about body mass index, you're not freaking out because, oh, wait a minute, BMI of 22, that's, that's pretty thin and lean. Unless you have a spinal cord injury, and I'll come back to that. So I'm actually uh, saying that um, with a BMI of 22, these folks were, in fact, obese. Um, 70% of them had low HDL cholesterol. We'll come back to that in a moment. 50% had uh, fasting blood sugars that would put them into the pre-diabetic or diabetic uh, realm. 55% had hypertension, uh, which was hard for me to accept until I began to learn more about this. Um, and in fact, almost 60% had um, metabolic syndrome by the International Diabetes Federation definition. So let's treat it. Um, first up on the list, nobody wants to talk about because we're in America and we don't do diet and exercise very well. However, um, when you consider the um, pharmacological options for our folks with spinal cord injury, we're, we're actually fairly limited. Um, the first couple, subutramine, the fenteramine, et cetera, those are not good options for folks with the sympathetic blunting that we talked about earlier. Orlistat uh, basically prevents the digestion of fats, and so you're going to have fat, greasy, flatulent stools, which is not, uh, I'll just tell you, our friends with spinal cord injury aren't going to appreciate that, so we really shouldn't use that as an option with this population. Certainly, when we want to get their blood pressures under control and consider using lipid-lowering agents um, and manage their diabetes. Now, just a caveat, when we manage diabetes, Generally speaking, in the medical community, we're taught to bring blood sugar levels down to a certain point, and that target tells us that we effectively treated um, diabetes, except that we didn't. What we did do was we increased the insulin sensitivity uh, to a number of cells in the body, and all of that blood sugar went into the cells, where it was subsequently stored as fat. Um, so let me tell you about the bad things associated with uh, adipose tissue. We know that it impairs fibrinolysis, that is, it causes clots. Why does it do that? It, it secretes sticky, sticky substances. Taffy and pie, anybody ever touched those, taffy and pie? Um, thrombin activatable fibrinolysis inhibitor and plasminogen activator inhibitor um, basically both contribute to clots uh, within the bloodstream, and so adipocytes increase the likelihood that you're going to have um, emboli or, um, uh, or thrombus, basically, that develops as you go through there. We know that adipocytes are pro-inflammatory um, and have recently reported, uh, uh, there's been a fair amount of literature over the years talking about inflammation associated with spinal cord injury. And um, as, as you read through, or as I read through the literature, it seemed as if folks were saying that the inflammation within the cord is causing a systemic inflammation for the rest of the person's body. And in fact, um, our hypothesis is that it's the cord injury leading to sarcopenia and energy imbalances that result in increased adipose tissue that increases these pro-inflammatory cytokines. So um, we actually reported out on this last year um, that in fact it's the adipocytes that are driving this vascular inflammation, systemic inflammation that we're seeing. Um, and we know that our folks with spinal cord injury have uh, an inordinate amount of these pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, present. We also know that there, and it's becoming stronger and stronger, is a tight relationship between obesity, adipose tissue, and the immunosuppression uh, within the body. And, and 
I don't have time to go into that literature right now, but it's becoming more and more overwhelming. Um, and so again, uh, somebody who maybe wouldn't have been in, immunosuppressed based on their genetic uh, makeup and whatnot, um, once they're placed in an environment of adiposity, basically they're going to phenotypically express what wouldn't, we wouldn't have seen otherwise. And, and that's because of all of these pro-inflammatory cytokines associated with uh, the adipocytes and the macrocytes that um, uh, accompany them in, uh, within the body. We also know that there are at least four different mechanisms by which adipocytes cause, obesity causes hypertension. Um, they secrete, adipocytes secrete angiotensinogen, a precursor to angiotensin, and subsequently increases uh, vascular constriction. Um, the pro-inflammatory cytokines actually reduce nitric oxide, and so the relative vasodilation we would have experienced um, is no longer present, and you have a relative vasoconstriction instead. Adrenal compression increases the amount of plasma volume associated with this as well. And then uh, subsequently we develop atherosclerosis. Without the elasticity of the blood vessels, blood pressure will go up as well. And we reported this back in 2007 um, in uh, close to 8,000 veterans. I was surprised to see quite a few of them who had uh, relative hypertension. Um, so. We also know that visceral fat, so the fat around the liver in particular, uh, contributes to an increase in non-esterified fatty acids. That's presented to the portal circulation of the liver. Now you've got, the liver makes two major types of, of cholesterol. It makes low density lipoprotein cholesterol, which is bad and it spews out triglycerides and free fatty acids into the vascular tree, et cetera. And it also um, makes uh, the, the good cholesterol, HDL, high-density lipoprotein cholesterol, which actually cleans up the vascular tree. However, when you've got a lot of visceral fat, it uh, increases the non-esterified fatty acids at the portal circulation of the liver. And instead of producing equal amounts of those, you end up producing more LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, and the good cholesterol becomes less and less so that you're not able to clean up the vascular tree as well. But wait, there's more. Adipocytes also uh, contribute to significant problems with diabetes. And so we know for, um, actually there are eight known mechanisms now uh, by which adipocytes cause insulin resistance. Um, and just as a reminder, this is a cell, any cell within your body. Um, and with, uh, with on, within the cell membrane, you've got an insulin receptor. You've got uh, glucose um, tr translocators, if you will, within the cell called GLUT4 receptors, for example. And as blood sugar, that's glucose, or G in this scenario, increases, then we also see, hopefully, um, that uh, the beta cells of the pancreas will release insulin. Insulin actually starts the PI3 kinase cascade that activates these GLUT4 receptors and allows them to translocate to the cell membrane. This allows a passage of glucose into the cells, but that system is broken um, as you accumulate more and more adipose tissue. Again, eight different mechanisms. I don't have time to go into these in detail at the moment, but I'm um, more and more surprised uh, at the way that we see this manifested in our folks with spinal cord injury. And since the 90s, actually even before that, we've been reporting um, impaired glucose, uh, impaired insulin resistance in our folks with spinal cord injury. Now we can manage that, but again, we have to be careful how we're managing because it's not just getting your blood sugars down. What that does is get the, the sugar into the cell where it's subsequently stored as fat, and it actually makes the problem worse if we're not providing adequate exercise and nutrition intervention at the same time. So way back in the day, we started doing oral glucose tolerance tests, uh, and this represents, um, in green, these are folks with tetraplegia. So those of you who are not familiar with oral glucose tolerance tests, you take a sugar beverage, um, and at time zero, your um, blood sugar typically is gonna be less than 100. But once you've taken that, it uh, quickly gets into your bloodstream, and within uh, 30 minutes, uh, certainly by 60 minutes, your, your blood sugar levels uh, become very, very elevated. In response, typically, 
you will pour uh, insulin out from the beta cells of the pancreas and get your blood sugar back down to normal. The line in pink represents um, able-bodied individuals, and this is what a normal glucose tolerance curve looks like. So as you can see, the area under the curve um, is very high for those with tetraplasia. Even those with paraplasia, and red represents uh, a combination of both groups. As we did this, we subsequently looked at the relationship. I thought it was going to be related to muscle mass, honestly, um, because muscle has all of these GLUT4 receptors, et cetera. But actually what we found and what more and more people are finding is the insulin resistance is tied to fat mass. And so glucose area under the curve actually uh, gets worse with increasing body fat. And this uh, slide represents uh, individuals, uh, both tetraplegia and paraplegia, but if you look at just paraplegia, that line becomes very, very tight. The relationship between area under the curve for a glucose tolerance test, that, that represents more and more insulin resistance, is tied to percent body fat. So, um, recently, uh, Dr. Nash and myself embarked upon a, a task uh, to talk about cardiometabolic disease in folks with spinal, how recent was that, Mark? Almost 10 years ago. We had a panel that has been working on this and we finally got it published in 2018 and it's finally coming out in the Journal of Spinal Cord Injury Medicine this year. But um, finally, we, we were able to say with some confidence that uh, Folks with spinal cord injury have an increased risk for cardiometabolic disease because of obesity, because of prediabetes and diabetes, because of hypertension and dyslipidemia. And, and we uh, put several pages of recommendations out there for folks to try to treat folks with spinal cord injury. Now, although we've done that, we haven't seen um, the treatment actually translocate into the clinic. Uh, and so many of our folks are continuing to have problems um, with this and, and we're gonna have to ultimately come back to why do they have such high body fat? So energy balance um, is that balance between physical activity on one end of the spectrum and energy intake on the other end of the spectrum. Now, some of you have heard of the Harris-Benedict equation. It's still used in our hospitals today. What? Um, although it was reported back in 1919. Um, and so basically what it does is it takes individuals, both men and women, uh, we have different equations for, um, it plugs in their weight, uh, it plugs in their height, and it plugs in their age, and it, and it puts out, this is their energy expenditure, that is approximate energy intake needs. Um, and again, uh, there are correction factors for this built into the equation so that a sedentary individual, once you find that number, you're gonna increase it by 120% to say what their expected intake requirements are. Um, if it's a person who's just sustained trauma, you increase that by 60, an additional 60%. Um, so let's take, remember our young man, the Army Ranger, uh, who came into our hospital at the Richmond VA. Uh, six foot one, 160 pounds at that time. He had a C4 complete spinal cord injury. We were able to wean him off the ventilator, so at least his diaphragm was generating some energy expenditure, um, but not many other muscle groups were working, and in fact, he was atrophying fairly quickly. His predicted basal metabolic rate, according to the Harris-Benedict equation, would have been 1,800 calories a day with the correction factor, a, a trauma correction factor that the dietician um, put in there. That would have been close to 3,000 calories a day Is was his um, expected energy requirements based on the Harris-Benedict equation, and, and I said, whoa, not feeling real good about feeding this guy, um, and um, because I don't think that he's burning that many calories. And so we did indirect calorimetry to determine how many calories he was actually uh, expending, and we found that um, his resting energy expenditure was only 1,280 calories a day. So. Um, Yes, 1,280 calories a day. So I'm not great at math, but th there is a mismatch there of um, over 1,600 calories a day, which means over the course of a week, he would have gained, that's 3,500 calories per pound of fat. He would have gained 3.2 pounds of fat in a week. He would have gained 14 pounds of fat 
um, in four weeks, so during his acute rehab course, and we wouldn't have noticed it because um, he was still losing muscle mass and bone mass because of inactivity. Um, so uh, keeping that in mind, hopefully this will move forward, I'm stuck. Ah. Keeping that in mind, um, Rodriguez, again back in the 90s, reported out, uh, she was in New Mexico at the time, um, that even if you overfed folks with spinal cord injury, gave them more calories than they needed, more protein than they actually needed, um, they still wouldn't achieve nitrogen balance. That is, they would still be dumping protein for muscle uh, because of the inactivity. Compared to trauma patients, similar age and gender, um, those folks achieve nitrogen balance within about three weeks. Um, so Rodriguez went on uh, five years later to uh, repeat the study with more individuals, and they said it is inappropriate, it is inappropriate to use these equations uh, to try to predict energy expenditure. But if you're going to use them, at least don't use the correction factors associated with them. Because our individuals with spinal cord injury are going to have an obligatory sarcopenia because of, that is, muscle mass loss due to the paralysis. And their resting energy expenditure is tied to their fat-free mass. Um, whoa, that happened quickly. Let me go back uh, a few. So resting energy expenditure. This is all of you are doing this right now. Yes. You've got this little factory going on within your body. Um, your heart is burning about 10% of your total daily energy expenditure, 7% uh, by the kidneys, about 30% from the liver, depending upon you know, how you partied yesterday. Um, the brain, except for the folks in this room, generally about 20% of your total daily ener energy expenditure. I know you guys are up in the 25, 30% of your total daily energy expenditures brain power, I get that. Skeletal muscle is the most variable of these components. Um, and so as we look at uh, the relationship between energy expenditure and particularly resting energy expenditure, let's see if I can do this, on the uh, uh, x-axis, y-axis, I just lost this, um, is, is going to be uh, directly related to the fat-free mass on the x, this is the x-axis, right, on the, on the horizontal. Um, this equation holds true. This is crazy for children and elderly. It holds true for men as well as women. If you were to take your fat-free mass um, and plug it into this equation, you could figure out approximately what your energy expenditure uh, is. Um, now, that's total daily energy expenditure. All of us are burning um, a certain amount of calories at rest. We call that our resting metabolic rate or resting energy expenditure. We also burn calories through the thermic effect of activity, so walking, um, exercising, all of those types of things. And then we burn a certain amount of calories digesting food. Yes, we burn calories eating. How fun it, well, usually not as many calories as we consume, just saying. So if we look at uh, someone like myself, um, with my age, height, and weight, I should be burning, hopefully still, about 2,800 calories a day. Um, if I was to sustain a spinal cord injury, however, and let's say paraplegia, so that my upper extremities and most of my torso is still intact, my energy expenditure would drop by about 25%-ish. If I was to sustain a spinal cord injury in the cervical region, and develop tetraplegia, however, my energy expenditure would drop by more than half, by more than half, my total daily energy expenditure. And so I'm at high risk for going into a positive energy balance. Um, if I can increase my, if I can't increase my energy expenditure through activity, then I'm going to have to decrease my energy intake or I'm going to end up, and, and what does this look like? A, a mere 200 calories a day over the course of a year would translate to 21 pounds of fat. Okay, again, fat, 3,500 calories per pound. Keep this in mind when you're talking about weight loss, per pound. Um, so somehow we need to determine um, or, or reestablish an energy balance. Um, and if you want to lose fat, you're actually going to have to go into a negative energy balance, but I'll come back to that in a moment. BMI, I mentioned earlier, body mass index. Body mass index is determined by your weight divided by your height squared. 
Um, we know that in the general population of BMI, less than 25 is considered normal. A BMI between 25 and 30 is considered overweight, and over 30 we consider obese. But BMI poorly uh, estimates uh, obesity in, in our folks with spinal cord injury. Um, and in fact, uh, this data as well as other data that, that we've reported over the years demonstrate that a BMI of 25, which is considered normal in the able-bodied population, represents about 35% body fat in a person with spinal cord injury. Um, so we need to talk a little bit about body composition just brief, very, very briefly. Body composition is essentially stripping the body down into its relative components of muscles, bones, uh, organs, and fat. Um, and without going into a lot of detail, there are multiple techniques available to determine body composition. Um, we've used a lot of them. The gold standard is called the four compartment model where we actually do underwater weighing to determine a person's body density, DEXA to determine their bone mineral content, and either deuterium uh, dilution or bioelectric impedance analysis to determine total body water. Um, subsequently, we can determine how much fat a person has by knowing those components. And so we did this in our folks with spinal cord injury. Um, 72 individuals mean age of 44. Their height and weight uh, put their average BMI at 27, which is just a little overweight according to uh, current standards. However, when we plugged them into the four compartment model, what we found is a BMI of 27 for this population correlated with a percent body fat of 44%. This was on average, mind you, meaning that quite a few of our folks had more than 50% of their mass, their body mass, was fat mass. Um, and in fact, these folks are swimming in fat in a way that none of the other populations that I know of, uh, you can look at any populations, nobody else has this relative amount of fat compared to their fat-free mass. Um, and so not surprisingly, we're seeing significant increase in these pro-inflammatory cytokines, the metabolic syndrome, as I reported earlier. So how do we go about establishing um, energy balance? We can look at uh, physical activity. There are exercise physiologists in the room. Yay. What does exercise physiology do? Um, lots of different things, including body composition, coronary artery disease, risk reduction. Um, we can prescribe aerobic exercise, resistance exercise, and we can look um, at exercise for neuro recovery, motor control. Um, as all of the residents should know, because I'm going to hold you accountable for this very, very soon, um, how do you write a, an exercise prescription? The same way you write a prescription for a medication. You list the diagnosis comorbidities, you list your goals, you list your limitations, the environment, the mode, the frequency, intensity, duration, and progression. And so we put together uh, an exercise prescription, but as we do so, we see all of these limitations in our folks with spinal cord injury that are not there for able-bodied individuals. And most exercise physiologists have no idea that all of these comorbidities are associated with a person with spinal cord injury and may uh, provide an exercise prescription that is unsafe. American College of Sports Medicine guides exercise physiologists to look at risk factors and the ones uh, highlighted in orange here are those for our folks with spinal cord injury. Generally speaking, they are already going to have high blood pressure, um, low HDL cholesterol, they're going to be um, either with diabetes or at risk for diabetes, and uh, obesity is going to be a hallmark feature. The other thing that our folks with spinal cord injury may have, and we don't know if it's because of heart disease or it's because of their spinal cord injury, is shortness of breath on exertion, uh, dizziness, uh, syncope, because of the parasympathetic dominance that we've talked about earlier, ankle edema, um, and then this unusual fatigue with normal activities. Um, so, uh, yeah, let me just jump ahead on this. Not that far ahead. Um, when you do upper extremity work, it feels like you're working harder than when you do lower extremity work, but in fact, you are burning fewer calories even at the same heart rate. So upper extremity work essentially costs more but burns less um, as you're going through that, which doesn't sound... <laughs> 
fair for our folks with spinal cord injury who are at least have full ability of their arms. Um, now, way back in the 70s and 80s, Barb Ainsworth put together a compendium of physical activities for able-bodied individuals. You can go to this in multiple tables of uh, some 500 different activities, and it tells you how many calories you're burning to shovel snow, or I guess you don't do that in Miami, um, rake leaves. I don't even know if you do that in Miami, but different types of activity. Um, unfortunately, that didn't translate to folks with spinal cord injury, and so a group of us in different VA hospitals um, actually looked at 170 veterans with 27 physical activities, and we determined their energy expenditure. What we found was, some of you know what a MET is, a metabolic equivalent. For an able-bodied individual, a MET um, is three and a half milliliters of oxygen consumed per kilogram of body weight per minute. You all are doing that right now as you're sitting there. And yet, what? Yes. But if you have a spinal cord injury, generally speaking, you're burning fewer calories at rest for the reasons that we talked about earlier. In fact, only 2.7 milliliters per kg per minute. Um, and so even if you look at different levels of spinal cord injury, the energy expended to wheel a wheelchair across a tile floor is significantly lower for a person with tetraplegia because they aren't using as many muscles as they go through there. So I could go into, and I have in the past, um, what does an exercise prescription look like for somebody with spinal cord injury? But, but, I, I've looked at over 400 manuscripts over the years. Dr. Nash has written a number of those, has also reviewed a lot, and I'm wondering, were we looking at the right thing? And so those of you who have seen this movie, it's a pretty fun movie, it's a little crazy, but there is a detective, Del Spooner, played by, what's this guy's name? Will. Will Smith, yeah. And there was a murder that occurred, and the bottom line is there's a little, little hologram that will answer questions, but this little hologram will only answer the correct questions. And so if you ask something that was not relevant, it would say, I'm sorry, my responses are limited. You must ask the right questions. And so I'm asking maybe is the right question for first, uh, persons with spinal cord injury when prescribing exercise, is it possible to achieve negative energy balance after spinal cord injury? Boom, and the hologram says that, Dr. Gator, investigator. Yes, that is the right question. Uh, <clears throat> so I take that in mind and then I say, wow, but I've got all these comorbidities to contend with when I'm putting together an exercise prescription, even for energy expenditure. So how do I prescribe exercise for fat loss? And I could go to the American College of Sports Medicine, the Dietary Guidelines of America. Um, but what I really need to do is to determine, can I burn enough calories to lose weight? And so we tried. Um, there was a three-year interventional study. We uh, were looking at folks with paraplegia between the levels of T4 and L2. Um, and looking at percent body fat, insulin sensitivity, glucose effectiveness, and, and oxygen consumption. Um, the bottom line was that we saw, down on, on the bottom line here, um, we saw improved percent body fat to reduction, uh, lower blood pressures, increased fat-free mass, HDL cholesterol increased, energy expenditure per session increased, but these folks gained weight. They, they gained weight, and it wasn't all muscle mass, unfortunately. Um, one thing I want to point out, however, is we started out on their first, I was comparing arm crank ergometry uh, with half of the group to leg cycle ergometry using functional electrical stimulation. And the arm crank ergometry is listed in red. You can see their first exercise bout. Um, the uh, arm crank folks were able to burn uh, in, a, in a one hour session um, just over 100 calories. That's not a lot, by the way. Um, and then at the end of four months, they could basically burn close to 200 calories per session, which is, you know, pretty good. The group with the FES actually increased significantly. Whoa, I lost something there. There it's back. <sighs> that was just to get that adrenaline surge that I can experience. So, <clears throat> so what, what we saw, though, is um, after eight weeks of training, the, the um, lower extremity muscle mass had actually increased so that we were burning more calories with FES leg cycle ergometry than we could burn with um, upper extremity work alone. Now the other part of the equation, and I'm running through this quickly, um, is, um, oh, energy intake. 
Um, none of us really want to talk about this, but we are going to have to talk about reducing our energy intake. This is hard. Why is it hard? We have a hypothalamus, all of us. The hypothalamus responds to all kinds of inhibitory and excitatory influences um, and generally speaking helps us maintain appropriate appetite or appetite suppression as the case may be. However, many of these factors unfortunately are limited after, whoops, are limited after spinal cord injury. I'm trying to come back to this. There you go. So, um, our folks with spinal cord injury don't feel full and they don't get the same signals to the hypothalamus that says, oh, by the way, you're full, stop eating. Um, so they've got that to contend with as well. And as we um, consider caloric requirements um, for folks with spinal cord injury, we can go back to the mid 80s and Cox reported out, oh, dude, just you know, eat uh, 10 calories per pound of body weight, okay? So that means somebody who has a spinal cord injury and weighs 200 pounds is going to be taking 2,000 calories a day, which is going to be way excessive. Um, how excessive? We'll come back to that in a moment. I'm really struggling with this. Uh, you would think when I push, there should be a response. There we go. Energy expenditure, can you measure it? Indirect calorimetry I talked about. Um, the ideal way to measure energy expenditure is through a bomb calorimetry. So we would take Dr. Gator, put him in the bomb calorimetry, blow him up, and see how many calories uh, that produce, it, it, you know, which is suboptimal for Dr. Gator. So generally speaking, we can put folks in a metabolic chamber and also figure out how much energy, based on the thermal changes uh, uh, that occur over time, was burnt. But there's only seven, maybe eight, metabolic chambers in the United States. What? Um, so indirectly, we can use um, calorimetry through oxygen consumption. So the amount of oxygen that you take in reflects the number of calories that you're burning as well. And so we could estimate, we tried to do that earlier, um, energy expenditure resting metabolic rate, but we recently uh, looked at this and have just reported it out. Over 300 studies looking at estimated compared to measured um, energy expenditure and, and we found that almost all of the equations were off, significantly off. And so we're recommending that if you're going to prescribe weight loss that you know exactly how many uh, calories the person is burning through indirect calorimetry. Um, we also know the able-bodied population, if you take your resting metabolic rate and you multiply it times 120% or 1.2, that will give you approximately what your energy expenditure is for a given day. But it doesn't work for folks with spinal cord injury because their, um, their MET, metabolic equivalent, is significantly less. So we modified the equation and we, we're proposing that for folks with spinal cord injury, once you know their basal metabolic rate, you estimate their energy expenditure, total daily energy expenditure, um, by multiplying it times 1.15 instead of 1.2. Um, calories, calories, calories. Ca we take in calories of different densities. Um, so carbohydrates and proteins have four calories per gram. Fat, consumed fat, has more than twice that number of calories per gram. Um, and alcohol, which has no nutrient value, unfortunately, um, is still contributing seven calories per gram as we go through that. So we recently looked at all the papers that have looked at diet in folks with spinal cord injury over the past uh, 30 years, basically. And, and, and the bottom line was, bottom lines were increasing. Um, folks, uh, based on what they were reporting and what we were actually measuring in terms of their uh, energy balance, uh, would be gaining about 16, 17 pounds of fat uh, per year, which is uh, suboptimal. The old food pyramid now translates kind of to the Mediterranean diet. Um, but uh, what we find on the very bottom are those foods that most people don't like to eat all that much. They, they, the, they're not pleasing to the palate, so to speak. And so we have to keep in mind that uh, green vegetables, raw vegetables, beans and legumes, fresh fruit, tomatoes, peppers, and mushrooms, those are the good foods uh, that we, we need to try to, and we need to stay away from 
is there such a thing as bad foods? So those with a lot of processed flour, sugar, oil, um, and oh, alcohol. Uh, so my finger is just not. We recognize that there are a lot of barriers to implementation uh, of diet and exercise for our folks with spinal cord injury. Um, and part of this is an expertise kind of thing. We need to train more people how to prescribe exercise and diets. Um, but part of it is we just don't have the data yet, um, and Dr. Nash will tell you, uh, that supports a certain kind of exercise or a certain kind of diet. And so one of the projects that I'm bringing here uh, from Penn State is my science project. Science being spinal cord injury, exercise, nutrition, conceptual engagement. That's my science project. Um, we are actually going to be doing home-based functional electrical stimulation, leg cycle ergometry, monitoring it from our laboratory in folks with high paraplegia and tetraplegia. Um, so five days a week, these folks are going to be exercising. We're going to monitor heart rate, blood pressure from our laboratory, and we can change the parameters on the bikes from the lab. What? Yes. We also, uh, I have nutritional colleagues um, at Penn State. They're going to do this telemedicine thing is crazy, isn't it? You don't have to be just next door. They are going to be providing nutritional intervention 16 weeks that go along with the exercise five days a week for 16 weeks to see if we can make improvements in percent body fat, fat free mass, um, and uh, lipidemia, dyslipidemia, I should say, and uh, glucose effectiveness, uh, insulin sensitivity. Um, so, in summary, I'm, I'm really close. In summary, obesity is a growing problem, especially in our spinal cord injury population. We know that obesity actually is the central mediator of the metabolic syndrome. That is, it causes dyslipidemia, hypertension, insulin resistance, and arteriosclerosis. Um, and our treatment options are limited from a pharmacological standpoint, but we really have to get hold of this behavior modification that is uh, exercise uh, and diet. Yes. And so, so with that, um, I'm excited to be here. This is the brand new rehab hospital that is structurally complete on the outside and almost uh, complete on the inside. I'm excited to be here with a group of you that also are passionate about working with folks with spinal cord injury to improve their quality of life um, and hopefully help them to become lean and, well, not mean, but lean and, and have a good quality of life for many years to come. Uh, long bibliography associated with this, I'm happy to send that to you if you're interested. Uh, but I would entertain questions or comments uh, at this point. <sighs> Yay. Or, or dead silence. Really, no questions or comments? This didn't... Dr. Nash, please help me. Yes. Excellent question. So let me answer that one first. Um, the, uh, the consortium, the PVA consortium guidelines basically talked about acute management of spinal cord injury, and they did, in fact, talk about the need to calorie restrict and, and optimize energy expenditure in the early phases. But nobody has really put that to the test. Nobody is, I, I shouldn't say nobody, there are very few centers that are looking at indirect calorimetry to determine actual energy needs during that acute phase. No, there are very few, I won't say it, there are very few centers that are looking at body composition changes in that acute phase. And so most of us are happy because the person's weight hasn't changed or we haven't looked at the weight, honestly, um, because getting them on and off a wheelchair scale is not easy. Um, and we just, it ha hasn't processed to us that the person's body weight may be lower than when they came into our unit, and yet their body composition has changed dramatically. So that's, those are excuses, um, but those are also opportunities for us to intervene sooner um, and more factually than we've done in the past. Great question. Next question. Yes. 
So, so the question comes back to um, how are we uh, determining the level of autonomic dysfunction in folks, particularly with injuries between T1 and T12. I mean, you can go all the way through there, since um, the sympathetic nervous system may or may not be blunted and to different extents with different individuals. Um, the autonomic standards are somewhat helpful. Uh, we can start to, to uh, be a little bit more precise in our assessment of autonomic dysfunction. We've not done great. Part of that is you know, simply looking at uh, heart rate, blood pressure parameters uh, in response to different perturbations, galvanized skin responses. I mean, there are some different things that we can do to determine the level of autonomic dysfunction. But I think that ultimately we're gonna have to come up with more precise tools to help to address that. Even without knowing that, however, we still get a pretty good idea of you know, energy balance. We can determine energy expenditure and energy intake, and I think that we can prevent uh, adipose tissue developing. Uh, the blunted sympathetic nervous system is going to make that task more difficult, um, but until such time as we have better, more precise measurements for the autonomic nervous system, I think that we have to use what we have available in our toolbox. So the question was, uh, is the INSKI exam insufficient to give us information about autonomic nervous system dysfunction? And the answer is absolutely yes, that's true. Uh, it is insufficient. And we need to be processing, we need to be thinking through more of this. And I know that there are some wonderful investigators that are looking at autonomic uh, dysfunction. Um, but again, it's not been precisely instrumented at this time. So, other question? Yes? I don't know if this is just like an absurd question, but with the fat itself being so minor and it's inflammatory, et cetera, for extreme cases, has anyone ever administered like liposuction? Would it reduce any fat? So, so, so the question uh, was what about liposuction? I mean, has that been trialed in folks with spinal cord injury? Um, there are only a few cases in the literature uh, where it's been trialed and to some extent has been effective. However, if you don't change the exercise um, and diet behaviors, you're gonna reaccumulate. Um, there's also the question of can you make things worse through that process? Um, and the, the potential there is yes, with electrolyte dysfunctions, et cetera, et cetera, that are that sometimes associated with that. But I think that that is a strategy that um, you know, we can look at with our, our bariatric uh, medicine colleagues here and maybe consider under extreme circumstances that kind of a scenario in a controlled trial. The other uh, option is the gastric stapling, the different types of surgical procedures that are used in able-bodied individuals to reduce um, artificially or surgically the um, ability to take in more calories. Um, I'm not a fan of that, uh, and in fact our recommendations are to be very, very cautious and probably don't go there because of the neurogenic bowel, the autonomic dysreflexia potentials, uh, the electrolyte disturbances associated with all this, the uh, intrinsic factors that are lost depending upon which area of the gut is stapled, et cetera. So um, everything that we know in the able-bodied population could be applied to spinal cord injury, but this is such a, an amazing model. Um, I think it really does give us, and in some ways, it puts us ahead of the curve, the big curve, um, because this population has obesity in a way that no other human populations have, uh, particularly with the amount of sarcopenia and uh, bone loss that goes along with that. So it's really a unique model and we have some tremendous opportunities. I, I always try to spin what might be negative into something good. Um, but wonderful thoughts, I uh, keep thinking those thoughts and other thoughts, uh, all of us, with our heads put together, haven't figured this out yet. And so uh, it could be one of you sitting in the audience who has, the, yes? Models, 
So the question was, do animal models reflect the human condition? And I'm assuming you're talking about adiposity. Sure. Um, and, and again, uh, with more clarification, do these models reflect the same amount of adipose metabolic dysfunction that we see in humans? Um, not quite to the same extent, um, but uh, you know, it'd be really interesting to take the Zucker rat, which is the obese hypertensive metabolic syndrome rat, and work with them with a spinal cord injury and look at some of that. Mark might know, uh, Dr. Nash might know, if that uh, has been done specifically. Um, I'm not aware of studies that have kind of moved into that direction, uh, but there is a significant amount of obesity that we see and sarcopenia that we see in uh, rodents with um, a model of spinal cord injury. Dr. Nash? So part, part of it is the genotypic expression as opposed to the phenotypic expression under environment of hypercaloric conditions. But yeah, there's an awful lot we don't know yet. And preclinical pre models may help us in some ways, but we haven't found the perfect um, model. I would say the perfect model is, is the human at this point. Yes? So the comment from the audience was that um, they've been using a porcine model uh, to uh, look at spinal cord injury. And in fact, um, those, those animals similarly gained obesity, uh, gained adipose tissue at a much uh, higher than expected rate, and they had to calorie restrict them just to continue the trials. So more to come. Thank you all very much for your attention. Um, I'm excited to be here.